Now it's time for Whispers, your number one source for all things paranormal, with your hosts, Jordan Klein and Nick Queen, and produced by the lovely Lola Miller. Whispers is brought to you by West Virginia Penitentiary Tours at the West Virginia State Penitentiary in Moundsville. Unforgettable, historical, educational. WKKX, the Valley's Watchdog, and UPRN, the UFO Paranormal Radio Network. It is 6.08 p.m., about 51 degrees in downtown Wheeling. I am live at the Market House Grill down in Elm Grove. Come out and see me. I'm by myself. Got Nick and Lola both at the studio having fun. Yeah, but you're eating. Well, no, I'm not. Why? I didn't I didn't feel right without you here, Lola. Aww. I, I give you permission to eat. You I, can have dinner. I, I couldn't. I couldn't bring myself to do it. Oh, right. I was like, as soon as the next commercial breaks, going, he's like, I'll take everything on this. <laughs> Give me this side. Yeah. Twice. <laughs> two of these, or one of these. I'm here. I'm here for two hours. <laughs> uh, our whisper special still going on. We just switched to Tuesdays. That's a bucket of beer and a pound of wings for ten bucks. Uh, one dollar domestic and two dollar well drinks. I got JT here with us. JT, how's it going? Not too bad. What's hey, going on? What's up, Nick? T- tell everybody why they need to come out here tonight. Oh, you need to come out, um, enjoy some wings, drink some beer. It's not too bad out here tonight. It's a good crowd. Fun for the whole family tonight. Always here. Always at the Market House. Give us a call, 304-214-1600. If you're out of the area, 1-866-514-1600. Again, I'm Jordan Klein, and Nick and Lola left me alone. Now, now, that's not yeah, that's not a really <laughs> accurate description. Now, yeah. I guess I kind of left you, you guys. You're never, that. you're never alone at a bar. That's Everybody's true. your friend. Where everybody knows my yeah, name. Yeah, yeah. Dun, dun, you really dun, don't dun. want me singing, but you know you get the idea. <laughs> I thought it. Now good. you don't sing in your plays, Lola. No, I do not. You do not. Oh, I do I, not I thought, sing in my plays. I, thought I want were... people to actually stay and enjoy the production. <laughs> That's the problem with me. Yeah. I, nobody wants me to sing either. Actually, people do want you to sing, Nick. It, it's just more to uh, – it's it's like going to a sideshow freak show. You know, it's, come here and listen to this. <laughs> you won't believe this guy. <laughs> you got to pay a quarter to watch him, but it's, it's ridiculous. Hey, if I could get a quarter to sing in the, on the street, I'd be there myself. <laughs> Because eventually those will add up. So now, uh, <laughs> Jordan, we—I uh, was asking about this before we came on the air. Yeah, what's up? Um, I, our um, our trip to the prison. Our trip to the p- prison's coming up. Uh, tickets are on sale now at the website whispersradio.com. You got to get there now. Get your tickets. They're going fast. Uh, there's a little more than a handful left, and uh, we're waiting for some seats to fill up. So. Uh, I uh, think, Nick, you put 15 up there to begin uh, with, right? Yes, I, I, I've i allowed 15. And then okay, so uh, let's... We've already got 15 people before we even put it up, too, that were... Yeah. I'm go- I'll be there, you know. So, so that, I mean, those might already be gone. I mean, you know, I haven't got... You, you're the one that has the access to see how many's left. So, you will need to let me know when we need to put more on. Yeah. So Because uh, with... we're limiting it to, what, 30? Yeah, we're limited to 30 seats. And remember, we have a now, demonologist... Uh, Dwayne Claude coming uh-huh. out from New York. He's going to be giving a presentation. We have uh, Herb Street coming to demonstrate his new way of investigating the paranormal, the Herb Street method. Why uh, do I always think of ESPN when I hear his name? <laughs> I think, I, I you know what I thought of, and, and I didn't want to mention this because you never know. I always think of uh, WKRP in Cincinnati. Wasn't oh. there a Herb <laughs> on there too? So Herb and Les. And then isn't... Um, yeah. Uh, okay. We still have... Sherry the, coming. The, yeah, Sherry uh, Brake might be coming. Yeah. Uh, she's trying to get that scheduled off. Uh, she's a uh, regular on the show. Uh, also, uh, we put out there before uh, the T-shirts, uh, design a T-shirt for the trip, for the event. Uh, whatever design we pick, uh, that person will get a free ticket to come. And we got another, we got some so, emails coming in for people. Yeah, we've got a few a few so far out and we want to wait a little bit longer just to check and see 
how many more we'll get before we actually make a deadline. I guess we are going to have to make a deadline. Yeah, we do have to make that. So, so we got a couple months. So, but yeah, it's June thirtieth. So, yeah, it's times are ticking, and uh, it's going to be fun times. I hate every everybody after we were sold out. Everybody was like, "Oh no, now we wanted to go." Well, right now we have tickets. So if you were were hesitant, come now. Come now. We want you now. Good times. So now, also uh, next week, uh, uh, you'll be back in the studio, and then we'll have uh, some music uh, b- playing as our intros. Uh, okay. I, and we, I kind of want to start announcing these beforehand because, you know, that way people know to tell their friends, "Hey, my music's going to be played." And okay. Well, stuff, next so. next week's artist is going to be the Astronomers. Uh, they're a pretty popular indie band out of Virginia, and uh, they do a lot of traveling. So uh, some of you might have heard them. They just got a new EP release. I can't for the life of me think of what the EP's name is, but they're a really great group of guys and a girl, and they sound pretty cool. I listened and to their whole EP place? yesterday. Do what? They, they have a pizza place, too? Do they have a pizza place? Guys and a girl in a pizza place. You're a little too young for that, I'm guessing. I hate you. Anyway, we've got I'm our sorry. guests are already right. on the line. All right, waiting. Nikki, introduce our guest. I can do that. Uh, Tina Fiorda and Til... Tildy Cameron, and I'm hoping I'm saying her name right, uh, recently published their first book, A Book of Insight, Wisdom from the Other Side, and they wrote it in a unique way. Uh, uh, Tina and T- uh, Tildy, are you with me? We sure are. <laughs> All right, I'm dying. Let's talk about how you wrote this, wrote this <laughs> book. First, I want to make sure I get the vi- uh, voices right. Uh, which one is Tina? I'm Tina. Okay, and Tildy, and yeah. I'm hoping I'm saying that right. That's perfect, and I'm, I'm Tildy. Tildy, right? Great. So that way I can hopefully get them right. <laughs> we we sound a lot alike, but yeah, we'll, we'll say, help you yeah. out. All right. we'll, we'll just call you the T's. There you go, T and T. And where T&T. are you? We're in Vancouver, British okay. Columbia, on the on the Pacific West Coast. Okay. All right. I just I knew the accent, and I just wanted to verify. That's all. <laughs> I, I didn't realize we had an accent. Yeah, we thought you had one. <laughs> See, that's and I'm from originally from Detroit, and I tell everybody I talk like the newscasters do. I don't have an accent. You've got one. <laughs> that's been a running argument all these years. What she doesn't realize is the newscasters have accents too. She just <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm the only normal one. Uh huh. <laughs> now is that Nick or Jordan? This was Nick. Yeah. No, I'm Nick Jordan. So I'm on Nick's a remote, so I sound a little one. bit different. <laughs> Jordan's the one that sounds like he's in a can. Yeah, I'm, I'm out on a live remote. So. Hi, Jordan. Hi. Okay, so let's get into this. How did you – tell us about the book and how you got the information for it. It's fascinating. Well, yeah, it, it certainly is a very uh, unique uh, method of writing a book and one that came very unexpectedly to us. Um, this is Tildy now, in case you're wondering. Okay. Uh, so long ago, uh, in our teenage years, Tina and I uh, started experimenting with a Ouija board, and just you know, being kind of playful with it, not taking it seriously at all. And uh, we continued to do this for a number of years, and found that we were actually able to connect quite easily uh, over time and with practice. And we ended up connecting with three entities that would come through to us on a regular basis Uh and we were given the names Melanie M and Demna and they told us that they were our spirit guides and that each and every one of us has spirit guides and they're always with us and they're always in the background helping us out trying to guide us and uh, one day in I think 2000 (laughs) Tina's whispering it in the phone well one day in 2004 uh, they came through and started delivering some material to us on meditation. And they delivered about a page of information to us. And at the end of the session, they said to us that this is the beginning of chapter one of your book. And we thought, wow, okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, but for some reason, we, we didn't take it that seriously. We didn't follow up on it until three years later. And in 2007, we sat down, had a session and we inquired about this book that they had you know, started channeling to us. And upon inquiry, they they proceeded to deliver more material to us. And at that time, they told us that they were going to deliver a book that was to be titled A Book of Insight. And it would contain 16 chapters. And chapter one uh, was to be titled Meditation. All right. Can I and, interrupt you just a second? Please. Now, 
All right, I'm thinking, you know, I'm I'm sitting uh, across the table from the the manager at, at the market house right now, and he's listening to, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, you're sitting there with a the Ouija board, so, you know, I got my hands on the table, he's got his hands on the table, and we're sitting there, we're like, okay, let's make a 16-chapter book with each word being on the Ouija. How long did that take? It, it took a little while. Like one letter at a time. <laughs> it, took a little, like, it was about three three months. Three to six months in total from beginning to end. And, yeah, and, and you just had to sit at that table for, like, the entire three to six. Like, I can't imagine, like, because it, it's one letter at a time. <laughs> it, for, for the most part, it's, we've gotten to the point where we've done it for so long that, uh, well, for one thing, the, the planchette or the pointer moves very, very quickly for us now. And it's oh. gotten to the point where we're reading and channeling at the same time. So th they're spelling out words, but at the same time, we're able to anticipate what's coming next. So it's a, a bit of a cross between spelling out the words and channeling it mentally as well. And and uh, what Tilly is uh, forgetting to tell you here is that I wear a uh, lapel mic. So we're not writing everything down. We're reading it all into a microphone and recording oh, okay. the session. Okay, yeah, that makes it a little bit easier because it's <laughs> like, yeah. You could almost get a computer with something like Dragon Naturally Speaking. That way you you spell, or say it, it types it into the computer, then you're done. Oh, so that should, would be you nice. You should look into oh, that. That's a great idea. Cause yeah, I would like that because uh, I'm. T this is Tildy, and I, I type all the sessions out, so that would be very helpful. I'll have to look into that. Yes, <laughs> it'd be well worth your investment. Now, <laughs> did any? Uh, how much of this did did it all seem to come smoothly, or did you have to go back and re-edit it, or did it all just come like, whoa, it's done? I don't even have to, you know, other than mistypes, you know, misspellings from yeah, that. Did, did your did your spirit guide use correct spelling and? You know. Well, yes, and and the interesting thing is we did very little editing. Once the book was channeled, we read it, and it uh, it caused us to come up with a lot of questions. It, it created more questions and answers at the time, so we made a list of all the questions and uh, and then channeled the answers to the questions. The only editing that we ended up doing when everything was said and done was putting the punctuation in the right place. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, we and we just uh, inserted the answers to the questions we asked because they delivered concepts to us that that were so new to us, things we we'd never heard of before. And so we would ask them questions about these concepts, and then we would insert those answers into the appropriate places within the book. But other than that, they delivered the entirety of the material. And as Tina said, we just added punctuation. Yeah. Now I I know this uh, I'm thinking when I started reading about this or you know looking at your website and stuff uh, I, it reminded me of uh, Jane Roberts uh, and I think in 1971 or 72 uh, she wrote a book called Seth Speaks are you familiar with that Jane Roberts uh, we are fans of Jane Roberts okay. uh, there you go Seth Speaks was um, channeled through a Ouija board well not Seth Speaks oh, but her the coming of Seth the very first book okay. I, I I just remember I know it was Seth something or Seth was in there somewhere, but mm -hmm. I, and I know um, there were, supposedly he's you know channeled through her uh, twenty something books and tapes and and even had interviews where you know and, and I don't know if they went through a Ouija board or if it was something like uh, he entered her or something, but uh, it, do you know if that was the same kind of thing or is this more of a like you, it, this, these spirits have never entered into you to speak, correct? No, we don't channel the way uh, Jane Roberts did. Her very first book was channeled through a Ouija board, and then from that point forward, uh, this entity uh, called Seth would actually um, enter her body, uh, I guess you could say, and, and start to speak the words through her. She would go into a trance state, uh, leave her body consciously, and Seth would speak through her. So we don't quite do it that way. We, we use the Ouija board predominantly. Okay. Yeah, al although I did have one experience that was rather unique when we were uh, doing a session for a very dear friend of ours whose father had passed away. And uh, at that point, um, for some reason, I felt this emotion welling up inside of me that, that felt like it didn't belong to me. And uh, Tilly and, and uh, our friend, were they were looking at me rather 
skeptically <laughs> and, and wondering what, what the heck is going on with her. Here she is getting very emotional. <laughs> and, and I was trying very hard to suppress this, this emotion that was rising up inside of me. And it got to a point where I could no longer control it. And then suddenly these tears just started coming through. And uh, and all I could do was go with it, and the board spelled out uh, the the tears that Tina is crying are my tears that I am crying through her at at the joy that I'm feeling to connect with you, and and that was the only time I'd ever experienced anything of that nature. Now now Tina, I got a question for you that goes along with that. Now you, you you're saying that you know in this instant you just couldn't fight it anymore. Mm-hmm. What do you do? Uh, you know, let's say something bad does come come through the Ouija board, you know, in whatever way you're using it, and it. it <laughs> sorry for all the noise in the background. They're having a good time. Uh, but you know, how do you protect yourself? I mean, if you you know can't control it, you know, if it gets too strong, how do you protect yourself? I mean, because you are opening yourself up. I mean, if it's if it's controlling you enough to control your hands around the table, I mean, how do you? stop it from controlling you? Well, I'm very happy that you asked that question because a lot of people use the Ouija board and uh, and they do open up a portal. And what we discovered very close to the beginning was to protect ourselves. And before every session, we, we do a meditation for half an hour to an hour. And before we do the session, we visualize ourselves protected by white light and we say a prayer of protection. And and this does protect us, and we've never had a negative incident. So for people who are listening who do use a Ouija board or whoever tried using a Ouija board, I just want you to know that you are opening a portal. And if you open a portal, anything can come through. It's like making a phone call. If you pick up the phone and you dial a random number, you don't know who's going to pick up that phone on the other end. And when you use a Ouija board, you're doing the exact same thing. Yeah, I think so that's a good So what I say warning. to everybody is, protect yourself yeah and also have very positive intent uh when you're using a board because that's very important as well don't treat it with a game Tre- don't treat it like a game treat it respectfully and and only have positive intent don't try to invite anything negative or you, or you will get that now i know you say not to invite anything what how uh how often have you gotten just these entities do you ever have trouble I guess dialing them up, or yeah. How do you pull the the same three uh, spirit guides? Well, uh, we we did in the very beginning have one experience when we first started working with the Ouija board, where we had an entity come through that started cursing at us, and it was at that point that that we learned that okay, what we're dealing with is serious here, and we have to be careful. And that's when we started saying the uh, prayer of protection and surrounding ourselves with the white light. Uh, when when we uh, do a Ouija session now, we connect very easily, and we know who it is we're trying to connect with. We're always asking for the same guides and or the same people, which is our three guides, yeah. and um, so they just naturally come through to us every time. All right, well, let's, we, let's talk about the guides themselves. Let's, uh, what was their names again? Uh, Melanie, M, and Demna. Okay, Melanie, M, and Demna? That's right. Okay, well, so what can you tell us about each one of these guides? Uh, let's we'll start with Melanie. Uh, well, how distinct are their personalities? How, uh, you know, they have knowledge of certain things themselves? Mm-hmm. Well, Melanie is my guide, and Tina has Tina has two guides. And <laughs> there's an ongoing joke with that. I figure she needs more help this time around. So she has two guides, and that's uh, M and Demna. And um, it's it's interesting because every time an entity comes through the board to us, we can tell that they're um, they're they're a different spirit guide because of their the way they move the planchette. Their energy is very different. Uh, sometimes we'll get uh, you know one of the spirit guides will come through and they will move the pointer very slowly and deliberately. And sometimes we'll have one come through and they're just their energy is so different that they're moving the planchette so quickly that uh, literally at times it has just flown right off the board. So that's how we can sort of distinguish their personalities. It's usually uh, more of a vibratory sense, I guess you could say. 
uh, rather than uh, the way we would distinguish between, uh, you know, our personalities here here in the physical plane. And uh, every now and then we do have an entity come through or a spirit come through that is new to us, but uh, we seem to be protected because of the, the uh, ritual that we follow and because our guides tell us they're protecting us as well. But we've had some very, very interesting uh, spiritual entities come through besides just our guides, and one in particular is helping us write book number two, and that came that was quite unexpected. So that was interesting. Now, okay, what was book? What's book number two going to be about? <laughs> well, well, book number two is going to be about the uh, awakening of mankind, and uh, and and what our future holds for us. Now, There's is this going to be kind of like a 2012 type of book? Cause well, a lot I wouldn't of say. I wouldn't say so much 2012. Our, our guides don't really focus so much on 2012. Uh, what they tell us that is that 2012 is not a date where all of a sudden we're going to feel a shift and, and something major is going to happen, whether it's uh, you know, a major spiritual awakening or whether it's major destruction. You know, We hear two sides of, of the, the coin there, the story there. Uh, they tell us that humanity is already going through a, a spiritual shift in consciousness. That's already happening. And uh, it, it's not something that's going to happen on any specific date. So we're already in the middle of it. But, uh, you know, they, they tell us that many probabilities still exist, and we determine the outcome of, you know, whether we do fully awaken within this lifetime or or whether it takes us a few few tries before we get there. Okay, now, uh, but how does it... Is it very much different than the book before, or can you kind of tell the same uh, voice uh, throughout the book? Because I, I know one of the things with like author Stephen King, there's always that voice there. Uh, you know, you can always tell you're reading something from Stephen King versus something from Charles Dickens or William Shakespeare, for that matter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so how can, does it sound like it's almost the same kind of uh, voice? I guess it, it's similar. Uh, but quite different because our the first guides that came through are our spirit guides, and the uh, guide uh, the other guide that's helping to write this book uh, as well as our spirit guides is a guide that calls itself by the name of Kaleem, and Kaleem refers to it as a group name uh, for a group of interdimensional travelers. So that so, was so uh, is, is quite Kaleem like your three spirit guides together, or is is um, he well, like a separate entity? Yeah. Well, well, Kaleem is not actually a spirit guide. Uh, Kaleem is a Kaleem refers to itself as a group entity. Uh, it it uh, encompasses many, many entities, and uh, Kaleem is the group name. But it's interesting because when they do come through, all of them uh, speak in a more – it's almost a more formal way of speaking than Tina or myself would do. And, you know, we both joke that they're a lot more eloquent than either one of us are. They're, they seem to be a lot more articulate than either Tina or myself. So I'm actually glad they're writing the book and not either one of us. Could it be because <laughs> English isn't necessarily their first language? I think that's exactly it. Uh, they, they tell us uh, to them – this language that we use is just a guttural utterance. That's how they refer to it. It's just sounds that we use to express our thoughts and emotions. Uh, they, they find it a, uh, to be a very limited way of ex expressing thoughts and emotions, but because they're channeling through us, they're limited by our, uh, basically our vocabulary and our language. Mm -hmm. Because they they just uh, communicate through thought form and vibration. Okay, I got to ask this though, because you said you're glad they're writing the book and not you. Mm -hmm. Whose name gets put on the book? <laughs> well, well, for, for for well, since the check is coming to Tina and myself. Now that is plagiarism, ladies. Uh, sorry, I'll give them to... credit on the opening page. <laughs> well, what the heck? well, they couldn't do it without us. Let's put it that way. It, yeah, it's it's definitely a joint partnership. But so my name and Tina's name's on the cover. But we uh we give full credit to to our guides in the book because it's really our guides who wrote this book. I mean, right. we just took the notes. Well, <laughs> I I have a question for you, and this is it's 
it really and truly, it'll sound funny, but stop and think about it. Sure. If you have, first of all, do you have the kind of relationship with them that you can ask arbitrary questions? We we ask them anything and everything. Okay. Then, no, they won't always necessarily give us the answer, though. Okay. They won't give us the numbers to the winning lottery no, ticket. That we was tried. my second one, but... Um, <laughs> There you go again, Lola. I can't help it. You know, always looking for an easy way. But um, th this is my question. It's on all of these ghost hunter shows and all this other stuff, um, and they, especially when they're in Europe, everybody assumes that any spirit that is there can understand English. And my question is, if you're in Germany and you want to just, you know, for example, and you want to communicate with a spirit there in Germany, wouldn't it make sense that they would not necessarily, especially if they're older, know English? That's a good question, and I've often thought about that. And my sense is that on the other side, there's a greater understanding than the one we have here in this three-dimensional form and dimension. Yeah. As, as an example, Tina and I, Tina and I are, are both. We have an Italian background, and we have channeled uh, our one of our grandfathers. We channeled who spoke only Italian, and every time he came through to us, he would only spell uh, spell the words out in Italian. He would never spell in English. Mm -hmm. Yes, which I I found to be kind of surprising, but um, yeah, that's cool. But that but having said that, uh, I mean, once you cross over lang language, you don't have the language barrier. You're just transmitting thought, so you can under you you can understand thought forms and patterns and vibrations. You're you're not limited to uh, to language. Okay. So I would think that when they're in Germany. Uh, doing an investigation there, there that the spirits should be able to pick up their thoughts yeah. as well. Yeah, okay, that that makes sense. But, I've, you know, it's I've just always wondered about that because they're in a foreign country and you're ta sometimes they are talking to spirits that are, you know, hundreds if not thousands of years old. And I just, truthfully, I thought it was an American thing, you know. Mm -hmm. We're just so arrogant that we think we, everybody we needs to speak arrogant. English. <laughs> Again. Well, it's yeah. Everybody we, should know English, and everybody should. Yeah. Every yeah. ghost should speak English. It's, you know, you it's, can you just well, talk? Turn off his mic. God. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. language. Yeah, but I don't think they thought that 200 years ago. You know. No, probably uh, not. A, well, no. th you know, thanks. I I just was curious, and since you have, you know, kind of, you can ask these kind of. You have somebody that will answer you with specific questions. Because sometimes that you know, spirits can be very, um, I don't know, not picky, but I know when we've had people in here, and even if it's say a relative of ours, and and you ask a specific question, you don't get a specific answer. You get kind of like clues, and you have to figure out the meaning of of what they're telling you. You know, so. Okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And I found that uh, uh, when contacting our spirit guides as well is that we have to be very specific in what it is we're asking, or we will just get a, a general answer from them. So they're they're very literal that way. How do you know much about their backgrounds and and say other lives that they perhaps have had? Well, they they tell us that. Uh, they haven't told us what other lives they've had, but what they have told us is that they have uh, been with us all our lives mm -hmm. and that we have known each other for an eternity. And there have been times when uh, we have not reincarnated onto the planet and have been spirit guides to them. And there are times when they are spirit guides to us. And uh, we found that very interesting. That they, So you're that, never, you're never uh, like alive together, I guess? Not not at this time, although there may be some times when we would have been alive together. I know that there is one guide that came through that called itself Mama. And Mama says that um, at this time she's one of our guides. Um, but uh, she said that in the past she was our mother during the Renaissance period. <sighs> and Tildy and I were brothers at that time. Oh, wow. 
So, yes, and, and that tells me that, uh, yes, it is possible that there are times when uh, we will be guides and there were times when we will all have lifetimes together. There, there's a whole world out there that we just do not know about that is beginning to reveal itself to us. And, and the interesting thing is, uh, and what our, our guides tell us in the Book of Insight, is that mankind is about to undergo his spiritual revolution, the opening of his third eye. And, and we are all capable of doing this. And, and we will become capable of having uh, higher powers of, of intuition and ESP, as it's called. Wow. Oh, yeah. And, and I mean, the, the thing we don't know, because the human race has been asleep, is that we are divine. And and that's one of the beautiful insights that have been given to us. Now, what do, you, what do you mean by that, by, by you know, the hum- we're, we're divine? We are all fragments of the source, which is what our guides refer to as God. We are all fragments of the source, having a human experience. And because we are all fragments of the source, having a human experience, we have a direct connection to the source which means that we also have a correct, a direct connection to the power, the energy of the source. And, and this, if, we, if we talk about biblical history uh-huh. and we talk about Jesus, when Jesus said, all these things that I do, you can do, and more, that's exactly what he was talking about because here's a, a prophet who walked the planet at one time who was aware of his divinity and his connection to the source. And this is what he was trying to teach humanity, is that we are divine. We do have that energy. And as we awaken and as we become more spiritually evolved, we will awaken to the fact that we are divine and we will begin to have access to that energy. And that's what our guides want everybody to know. Now, I know you said before uh, you're not necessarily looking at 2012. Um, I know, I think it was last week, and my days are running in uh, in uh, just together at this point. But last week we talked to somebody that was kind of not necessarily the exact same th- uh, thing, but you know, along the same lines of you know that uh, you know that man's you know uh, going towards this point where they're going to be more spiritual and connected to you know. Uh, not necessarily the source, but I uh, you know maybe to, to this divine kind of power. Do you think it's circulating around 2012, or do you see it more as a gradual thing that might you know doesn't necessarily culminate then, or 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 even totally not even connected to 2012 at all? Well, I, I think 2012 is uh, very. It's more to do with the Mayan calendar. It's, our guides tell us that definitely there is a connection with 2012 in that uh, all of, basically that our awakening is starting to speed up right now. Time is speeding up. Uh, these shifts in consciousness are starting starting to speed up. Things are happening more quickly now. But as to whether or not that particular date means that there's going to be a sudden shift when we hit uh, December 21st, 2012. They tell us that there is not going to be a sudden shift on that day. The shift that is connected to 2012 is already happening. And, uh, you know, when you talk about earth changes, there are people that think that we're going to see major earth changes and catastrophes happen, happen around December 21st, 2012. But we're already seeing earth changes Uh, you know we're already in the middle of all that so it's not going to be one huge climactic thing that's going to happen on one date sure we're already in the middle of it we've actually heard that several times you know you know people don't think that it's going to be you know that day you know something bad's going to happen it's just going to be you know a gradual change and i think uh like nick said our guest last week said it was it's been happening for like 30 years i believe yeah you know so yeah gradual change is, is what most people are saying it is yeah, I mean, 2012, what we will see happen 2012 is a planetary alignment. That That's the main thing that they're expecting to see December 21st, 2012, is this planetary alignment. But the shift itself, that's ongoing. I mean, we've, uh, you know, humanity has been evolving since the beginning of time, since we first 
uh, you know, stepped onto the planet. We've been in a continuing process of evolution. Uh, so that's been going on forever. It just happens that at this particular point in time, uh, we're seeing things speed up now. And we notice it as well, uh, you know, as an example, your radio show. There there was a time maybe five to ten years ago where we couldn't even discuss these types of topics. You wouldn't oh, see yeah. many... Yeah, you wouldn't see radio shows like yours on the air. Whereas now, we're seeing, I mean, you talked about the, the paranormal shows on TV, the ghost haunting shows, all of that kind of thing. We're seeing so much more of it, and it's actually becoming mainstream now. And, I mean, there was a there was a time where we, we probably would have been hung or burned at the <laughs> stake for putting out a book like this. And now it's just becoming more mainstream. Now, I, I know there was a question on the uh, chat room from uh, M. Marilio, and I'm hoping I'm saying the name right, but uh, uh, he said, what do you mean by shifts? Uh, then he said trance. Uh, are you talking more like a paradigm kind of shift or something else? A, a paradigm shift, yes, and and that is happening now because and, – and in the shift in awareness because what our guides tell us is that mankind's evolution is meant to evolve spiritually because we are spiritual beings. And this is all part of the shift, and, and people talk about 2012 being, as Tilly was saying, the date, but it's happening now. People are becoming more aware. People are becoming more spiritual. People are beginning to realize what's happening on our planet, and they're not asleep anymore. They're waking up, and that's part of what our guides are talking about when they talk about the shift. Yeah, and I, and I think people are also starting to remember that we are actually spiritual beings. We forget. Uh, you know, you, we're so caught up in our day-to-day -day reality that we think that all that we are is this physical being living out this physical existence here on this physical planet. We are spirit first and foremost. And as spirit, we are intuitive beings. That's a natural part of who we are, our intuition. As spiritual beings, our, our natural senses are psychic senses, you know, what we refer to as six senses. And I think more and more people are also starting to become aware of that. Th that's starting to pick up a little more. Uh, you know, pe you're seeing a lot more uh, meditation classes, uh, people getting into yoga, spiritual practices that remind us of who we really are. Uh -huh. And that's all part of it. Well, see, and I think somebody brought up one time about um, indigo children, that that's also part of this, that the, the kids that are be, being born now are either developing their intuitions and their empathies far more than kids did in the past, say, of our generation, but they also think it has something to do with this shift that's going to, or that is occurring, and that's why we're getting kids that are are being born with this intuitiveness, if nothing even greater. That's exactly it. And our guides have told us in the books that uh, all of us that are here on this planet today are here because of what is happening, and we're all part of it. And the indigo children and the, and the psychic children that are being born now are part of our future evolution. And what our guides tell us, too, is they want us to meditate because we we really undervalue the importance of meditation and as we continue to meditate we will continue to open our third eye to open our psychic awareness and to open our connection with the source in order to continue this evolution and what they tell us too is that as we evolve spiritually our dna will activate to generate many of the subtle senses that currently lie dormant within us so this is very important, and they tell us that this is our destiny. And mm -hmm. and so we need to remember that this is our destiny, and also we need to stop living in fear. And we need to remember that our thoughts, our beliefs, they all have energy. And what you think, what you believe, you will attract. So we really need to come together as a humanity, and we need to focus on our oneness, we need to focus on our beautiful future, on our beautiful awakening, and in focusing on that, we will attract that instead of the fear that we're being fed through, let's say, Hollywood movies 2012, because 
that's what they make money on. They don't make money on beautiful, love, love, touchy feely movies. They make money on movies like Fear Mongering 2012. <laughs> so we need we need to remember that. And I know because I work in the film business, so I can I can say that. <laughs> now, I, uh, for something that was, I was found kind of interesting going through um, uh, uh, the outline of your book was uh, reality. Uh, which is chapter 10, and uh, you talk about the reason for the creation of planet Earth and so forth uh, that your guides had mentioned. Uh, and the first sentence is that reality is but, a, or, or at least in this, is reality is but an illusion of collusion. So are you trying to say, are you trying to say, but are you sort of saying that, uh, that in essence, we all kind of created planet Earth as a place for us to exist or... Am I totally off, or no? No, that's exactly it. We okay. or the source, we as fragments of the source, uh, created planet Earth as one avenue of experience and expression. Uh, they tell us that that the source is on a journey of self-discovery, and so this particular planet is one of of many planets, one of many realities, many dimensions, universes that was created by the source as a way of experiencing reality and um, coming to a place of self-actualization, which is all knowingness, all awareness, uh, because the, the source, uh, our guides tell us, is not static. The source also uh, it continues to create and learn through, or experience through its creations. So uh, this particular planet happens to be a three-dimensional planet. We're having a three-dimensional uh, experience on this planet, but there are also other dimensions that exist where there are other beings uh, having their own types of experiences there. Well, like uh, uh, you mentioned here, uh, dinosaurs. What exactly was the purpose, I guess, of the di age of dinosaurs in our evolution? The, the purpose of the dinosaurs, our guides tell us, was to uh, begin to create an experience of um, of reality. For instance, uh, we're solely animals that lived on on instinct, and and once the once the uh, source experienced it on that level, the source was ready to move on to the next level, which was the level of of, of logic. And so it, it it's taking baby steps, one step at a time, before it evolves to the greater concept of reality. Okay, now how about alternate realities themselves? Uh, uh, a lot of people feel that there are other, I guess, parallel cre uh, creations or, you know, worlds that kind of stacked on top of our own, uh, goes into maybe shadow people that might be actually in the same kind of existence, but just uh, maybe a shift left or right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Our, uh, Sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, I, I'm sorry. I, I <laughs> coughed a little bit. That's all right. Uh, yeah, there's a chapter in our book called Alternate Realities, and our guides talk about all the different realities and dimensions that exist concurrently with our p particular reality and dimension. And uh, one of the interesting things they talk about is how um, they, they refer to these alternate realities as probable realities. And what they tell us is that Every single probability that could play itself out already exists in another dimension. Therefore, there are actually versions of ourselves, probable selves, that also exist in these other realities or dimensions. And, and so there are copies of ourselves. They're, they're exact copies except for very minor differences. Um, perhaps a, a difference may be that in another reality I exist as a doctor or, or a musician or whatever it may be. And all of these realities play themselves out, and they're all for the purpose of the source experiencing reality on many different levels. And uh, that was one of the concepts that was really new to Tina and myself, and about, I think it was about two months ago, I, I saw a program, it was on the internet, and it was a documentary on uh, quantum physics. And there were a number of well-known quantum scientists that were discussing this very concept. And they were basically saying the same thing, that these probable realities do exist. That wasn't 
there was no question in their minds. The only question was how many of them are there. Now, now do you think that this is kind of what deja vu comes from? I've heard people say that that's just the other, you know, dimensions. It, it could very well be. It could be just a, a brief glimpse into another dimension or a brief uh, remembrance of one of those probable realities. That, yeah, that see, I, I, totally, I totally believe that because I... I Deep down, I have to believe that in another dimension, another reality, that Jessica Alba and I are are together. <laughs> this, and is you know called, what? this is a fantasy reality. <laughs> you know, but and, you and, know what? That fantasy reality exists. And thank you. The, thank and you. You, know, you, you just, just made it, Dad. That's exactly what I was going to say. I have the biggest grin on my face right now. <laughs> <laughs> you have hooked up with her in another reality. Woo! Oh, my God. John Blackmore will be so jealous. <laughs> I hope he's it's okay because he's hooked up face. with her, too, in another reality. <laughs> Come on now. So it's all good. I, and I, I'm I not even going to go there. <laughs> well, you know, this is almost reminiscent of... One of the subplots of Fringe on Fox, that weekly show, where oh, yeah. everything is that there are two, at least two, parallel universes. And the premise behind it is once that they develop a way of getting, of breaking through that, that thin veil and getting over there. But you have to keep both sides equal. If something from here goes there, something from there has to come here, and you have to keep it equal. Oh, that's interesting. It's that it's a fast. I mean, aside from like they're they're chasing kind of monstrous things once in a while, that part of the show is so fascinating because that's kind of the the turn that Lost has taken now in this final season. That there's you know several realities going on at once. Don't give it away too much. Nikki hasn't seen it. <laughs> but, yeah, but you know let's talk about Lost. <laughs> you know what's really interesting is, is that a lot of these TV shows, like, I mean, I remember watching, even watching the original Star Trek or the Star Trek that's happening now, you know, and the, and the concepts become reality. And, and a lot of these shows, they do uh, delve into concepts that eventually uh, become proven or become our reality. So it's, it's very fascinating that these shows are, are delving into these concepts. Now, do you think that's because that perhaps, you know, like you said, we're all going towards this, that these ideas are starting to, co uh, to come to fruition and that mm -hmm. these directors or producers or writers are expressing um, their beginning understanding of this? I, I think so. I think so. And or, or I think that it's they're trying to alert us in their own way to let us know. And this is how they can do it without mm -hmm. coming right out and saying, "Hey, people, this is this is what's possible." If we watch it on TV, the more we watch it on TV, the more we become used to it. The more we become used to the concept, and once it becomes a reality, we're not floored by it. We uh, accept it more readily. Uh huh. Now, uh, uh, I believe we are running out of time. Yes, ladies. we are, darn it. I, I do want to say uh, we have your book available on our website. We have it linked up so that uh, our listeners can buy it. That's whispersradio.com. Uh, Nick usually got If you have any websites out there, do, do you have a website? Yes, uh, you can also get a signed copy of our book at abookofinsight.com. Abookofinsight.com. Yeah. yeah, and we're available through, through amazon.com.ca as well as barnesandnoble.com. Okay, Nick, and, are, you, are you linked up to Yeah, it's all linked. Oh, are you on Facebook? There. Yes. Okay, so are we. And we've got a YouTube channel. There we oh, go. Okay. Great. Yeah, if you want to send me those links, I'll add them tonight. And we'll okay. make sure those get on our website. That way, any of our listeners that listen to the recorded show can uh, can catch up with you guys. Uh, Perfect. Well, thank you guys very, very much. You have a really interesting story. Uh, oh, this has very, been fascinating. Very oh, interesting been a blast way of, for us. of writing this. You know, I'm still. My brain's still trying to wrap around it all. Hey, Just, so is ours. <laughs> so is ours. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm joking. <laughs> That's okay. He gets speechless like this all the time. Oh, I'm just, so. I, I like you guys so much. I'm just, I'm He's getting still choked thinking up about Jessica. I have to say yeah, <laughs> yeah. Don't let him fool you. Yeah. <laughs> He's still choked up over the Jessica Alba thing. Oh, don't yeah. let him fool yeah, you about you, that. You, you made my day. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> all right, ladies. Uh, like I said, thank you very much, and uh, we'll, we'll be getting in touch with you again, especially when that next that new book comes out. We want to make sure that we uh, we do some promoting with you on it. 
Love it. Thank you so much for Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Our pleasure. Bye-bye. 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 Wow. So what do you think, Lola? You think you're going to be able to write a book with a Ouija board now? You know what, though? I have been so leery of Ouija boards, and yet as they were talking... I was thinking, hmm, yeah, I, I don't have one anymore. I mean, I, I pitched it a long time ago, but, you See, know. I'm, it I'm is, still unsettled. I, I know. I, well, I, you know, maybe if you go through the steps of, you know, the protective prayer and things like that. But I just, I would rather be with them one time. Because they have guides that, it, you know, their link is established and. I would be yeah. less less leery. <laughs> see, um, see where, where I'm at, though. I mean, they even said. I mean, she said, you know, it is a portal, yeah. and you have no clue what's going to come back. Yeah, I, mean, I know. Whatever they're talking to could just say. I mean, what was the uh, the group that calls itself one thing? I forget its name. Yeah, I know what you're Khalil talking about. Khalil or something that. like yeah, that. Yeah. It, uh, isn't that Superman's dad's name? Kind of. Okay, but uh, you know, I'm thinking <laughs> like every every t- whenever she said that, I was thinking like we are legion. You know, we are many. You know. From you know the demon possessed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and that's what I kept thinking. I was like, oh my gosh, because I mean, you could say whatever you want to say you are, but well, there, yeah, there's no guarantee that that a spirit that you've been well, it's, you you have no guarantee even on Facebook if you're actually oh, yeah. talking to somebody that you know. Like, but man, I'm talking to a really pretty girl on Facebook. It's yeah, really look at like you were already having an affair with Jessica. Guy, you know? And it's Jordan. <laughs> and it's it's me. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I find that whole thing really fascinating, and you know the thought that somebody is is trying to pass a, a, a real message of substance to us. That you know, it, it just I find that whole thing fascinating. But I would love to sit down with them and let them control it. That way, if anybody gets uh, that's right possessed, it's them and not yeah, you. yeah. I'm thinking that. Yeah, uh, yeah. But okay, we need to take a break. All right, everybody, you are listening to Whispers Radio on AM 1600 WKKX, the Valley's Watchdog, UPRN, the UFO Paranormal Radio Network. It is time for CNN, and then we will be right back tuned. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Whispers Radio here on AM 1600 WKKX, the Valley's Watchdog. And UPRN, the UFO Paranormal Radio Network. It is 7.08. I have no clue what the temperature is. What's the temperature at, Lola? Cold. It's cold outside. Well, actually, it's... it's 51 degrees, it says over here. It's still well, 51? Well, but it's windy, it feels windy, colder. windy. And it, but I'll tell you, honestly, it felt warmer when I left to come back here at a quarter to six than it did when I left here at 3.30. I think because the sun is out. Well, let me tell you, I went camping last night out at Seneca, uh, and I figured I'd go fishing all day today. Uh, and I had my shorts and my T-shirt my tackle box, and I walked outside, and I said, nope. Opie ran back in. <laughs> and then I walked right back inside. You didn't have to stay in a tent, though. No, I didn't have a tent there. I don't so want I people thinking camper. you were trying to rough it. Your idea of roughing it's in the... Uh, in a camper no. with, uh, with ca- satellite TV. My dad's idea of roughing it is sitting in a camper. He has, that's what he said. He said, as soon and as, I like his idea. He said, as soon as he got rich, his idea of roughing it changed drastically. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Growing up, we always camped in tents. Then See, we got like a, a camper, a big trailer thing. You know, I mean, it was like yeah, that's bedrooms and stuff. And uh, you know, then oh, a tent? You've got to be joking. Now it's like, <laughs> if I am not in a motel or a hotel. I am not going. Yeah, see, I, I usually keep a tent sitting out in like in in the little yard area in front of his camper, uh-huh. and you know that's where I sleep because you know that, that's what I like. That's the, that's the fun about camping. You know, you're out there and you're sleeping on rocks and cooking wieners on the fire. Yeah, and fighting ants and mosquitoes and deadly raccoons and you, oh you, yeah, you, that's you just so have much a miserable fun. Time, don't you? <laughs> Uh, give me a hotel with room service and a pool. Oh, love oh that. that's. This turned into like Green Acres argument at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fairly. Give me Park Five Avenue. It is that life for me. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Well, Jordan, you're uh, you're at the. What's happening to where you're at? I am at the Market House bored. Grill down here in Elm Grove, having a great time. Got all kinds of people here to see the whispers happen live. 
foods that are pouring out. We got what the special today, 10 bucks for a pound of wings and a bucket of beer. And then a dollar domestics, two dollar well drinks. Why? Why would anybody pass that up? Come out here and spend some time with me. Did you, have, you, have you ate? Have I ate yet? No, I, I'm I'm on a hunter strike until Lola comes down here, or or until somebody cooks me something, JT. And <laughs> I knew the, I knew your hunger strikes. They they don't last long. My, my hunger strikes last until I find food. Jordan sees some injustice. <laughs> I won't eat anymore. I'm like what, Gandhi. What's that? Oh, yeah, I don't have a cause yet. <laughs> now, um, we were talking before, and I want to make sure we touch on this stuff again because it's important. Yeah. Uh, we're going June 30th to yes. the uh, prison. If anybody wants to go and see you run through the prison, scared half to death, cowering in a corner. Or see Nick scream how, like a girl when bats fly around him. <laughs> then that, I can guarantee, will happen. <laughs> A lot. So come out. We're we're charging sixty five dollars. Usually the pen pen overnights is sixty bucks. And that's a, a deal to see me cower in fear from the bats swooping in my head. But, Lola, you saw that. Wasn't that fun? Yes, it did. Definitely did make the night. My 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 favorite though was uh, I was walking into the um uh jeez what is that the boiler room they call it uh, going down into the basement. Yeah. And I was walking and I cannot remember who it was in front of me. I think it was uh Kelly. Uh, was it Kelly? I, the one that got in her hair? Oh, no, that wasn't Kelly. Uh, this, uh, this woman, poor woman, because I can't remember her name first off, this bat comes in, and they were going, because you have to kind of think it's like an intersection here, and she had walked right into the middle of the intersection, and like two bats come through. The, she swoops from the first one, like di dives down. Second one got caught in her hair. It's great fun, people. And there's ghosts. See, but, but the great thing about this year, Nick, which you, you neglected to say, uh, we have Dwayne Claude coming from New York City, who's a demonologist, to give a presentation on demonology, uh, courtesy of the Grand Grandview Park in Moundsville. Uh, we have Herb Street coming to uh, teach his uh, special method, his Herb Street method. We have Sherry Brake coming to uh, dispense her wealth of knowledge. Babysit me is why, why babysit Sherry's Lola. coming. Uh, pro uh, she, she probably is just coming for you, Lola. <laughs> She loves Just you save guys. you, save you from us. And you get a T-shirt, right? Yes. So I mean, come on, name name a place in the valley that does that. No, nobody, nobody but whispers. I was about the name. Never mind. Huh? I, what? No, I'm sorry. So go out there, whisper, whispersradio.com. You got a place uh, right at the top that says, uh, "What's it say? Ghost hunt." Yeah, I think it says Ghost Hunt. You click on sure. Ghost Hunt. It talks about uh, kind of what we're doing, and you can purchase your ticket right there. And it's secure. It's going through PayPal. Uh, you know, we nobody's getting your information but them. Uh, so what more do you need? So. It's good times. It's good times. and it's. I, I know it's a Wednesday, and a lot of people are thinking maybe uh, Wednesday is bad to – Bad to do something like this, but you know what? It's worth it. You can take a, a day off work. Yeah, take a personal day or you know, vacation day or sick, sick day, day or just lie. You, know, you, you, you woke up with diarrhea that morning. You couldn't go to work. <laughs> wow. Oh, Too sorry. much information on that one, but here. everybody can come up with their own disease. <laughs> well, Clever, cleverest disease you call off for work. Maybe we'll give you, a, we'll give an you something. An extra prize. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay, <laughs> we do have our guest on the phone. All right, so. Nikki, you want to introduce the guest? I can do that. Um, I'm going to try the and, and sean you can tell me if i mess this just destroy your name uh <laughs> sm uh, belakarov but we're going to call Belkarov. you sean b or sean <laughs> that better, yeah that um, better. And actually i was going to enjoy the interview but i could know it's a bad case of hypertrichosis so prophyria what can you do see, see but i have to be able to know what the <laughs> disease is to oh, it's, a were, it's a werewolf and vampire disease there you Sorry. go <laughs> it's a full moon i can't come in today exactly um, but, you're the author of the 2012, and I actually have it right in front of me. I'm not sure if Jordan does because he's not in front of me, but 2012, the Paranormal Cookbook. Before I even opened it up, you win the award for the greatest cover ever. <laughs> uh, Thank, you. Thank you. You have a gray, a man in black, Heath Ledger's Joker, and a werewolf <laughs> playing cards. Yeah, it's kind of a parody of the uh, d the classic dogs playing poker, uh -huh. which I grew up with, so I put a little spin on it. Now, why do why do you have a, a picture of uh, President Obama behind them? 
<laughs> yeah, well, originally, actually, it was going to be Bush because Bush was, and all this stuff kind of ties in together, but uh, we went with Obama because he was in office, and um, there's a lot of uh, people out there that kind of, you know, perceive politicians as tricksters, and we kind of go into some of the trickster stuff in our in our text, so we figured, you know, it'd be good to put it in there, plus 2012, and uh, Obama's around until at least 2012, so we dated ourselves. Hmm. Now, uh, what... Uh... What exactly? Where did you get the idea for this? Where? Do you, how do you get into this? First off, I know you run a group out. Uh, you're in St. Louis, correct? Uh, Springfield, which is a little bit. Okay, I always say St. Louis. I don't know why. Uh, Springfield. <laughs> what exactly is the name of your group? Okay, uh, we got Spooks. That's the name of the group, which stands for Springfield Paranormal Organization, operating with kinetic surveillance. Uh, I'm the, yeah, wow. I'm well, that's why we don't put it on the business cards. You know, <laughs> ten mile long business. You need card. a long one. Exactly. Um, but uh, there's me. I'm uh, the primary field investigator, uh, the paranormal profiler, which I go through basically it's a fancy term I made up for just having to do a bunch of research on all things paranormal. Um, my wife is uh, originally from South Korea, and her mom is uh, what's called a mungbang, which is like a Korean shaman. She's uh, actually been consulted by Buddhist monks and uh, even the first uh, female presidential candidate in Korean history. So she's uh jenny which is my wife uh her since her mom's kind of had that ability i think it passed on to her and she really uh is the one that gets the really good photographs for us as far as uh uh you know anomalies on film and this type thing and then we got a couple other members we got a videographer and uh a uh, guy that does uh background research and some of the, the another one that does folklore but that's that's the core of the team so now do you guys get a lot of uh, uh interesting cases there. Yeah, the uh, well, late, most lately we've been uh, looking into some werewolf sightings along the Arkansas-Missouri border and the uh, Missouri-Oklahoma uh, border. Um, this time last year, we were chasing around uh, Paul the Nixa Hellhound, which is uh, what took about four months of investigating, just now, kind of chasing that? our tails. Um, it's the classic Hellhound. I mean, it's uh, Hellhounds are the dog, the kind of ghost dogs, big black ghost dogs generally. That kind of haunt the uh, the highways around the world, and they're pretty much in every culture. No, no. And uh, we have our own history here that dates back to eighteen the eighteen eighties. Now, now um, I gotta ask how you how you find evidence of a werewolf to. Yeah, that's you know it's one of those kind of things that is uh, very. Uh, it's just, there's not a whole lot you can do besides you know trying to do tracking, taking statements, these type things because it's so sporadic generally. Um, you know, possibly uh, if you're up in Wisconsin or, or Michigan with a dog, then you got a better chance of, you know, but we're, we're really chasing our tails, pun intended yeah. on that one. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, you take people's sightings, you try to gauge whether or not they seem to be a credible witness, uh, whether they experience something real, you go out to the site, kind of check it out, look for any uh, physical disturbances, physical evidence that might have been le left, and uh, you kind of go from there. But, I mean, you know, trying to pair the only way you're going to prove werewolves is you catch one and put it in a cage, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I wouldn't want to see what would happen. I, I, more better you than me on that one. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, right. I, I I see this, uh, and I don't know why I get this image, but uh, like you know, someone's got this cage kind of set up, like the stick and a right, string. Right, right, with a little with a carrot or something in there. A yeah, it's like what, I don't, what do you there? trap a <laughs> werewolf with? I don't know. But, I don't know either. <laughs> but I have a feeling it's gonna go right through the cage. So yeah, I'm thinking, I'm thinking so. No, but I, I it was an interesting article I read a little while ago. Uh, it was by one of, an anthropologist over from one of the Ivy League schools. I can't remember which one, but he was talking about how uh, Darwin, in essence, killed the werewolf because uh, ever since the uh, Darwin's evolution theory and the you know men from monkeys theory kind of took hold, there's been a big up uptick in uh, men, you know, like men apes and and, and uh, bigfoots and sasquatches and these type of animals, whereas we used to see it much more uh, with werewolves. So he thinks that the, the focus has shifted, but we're still seeing the same thing. We're just perceiving it differently. And I thought that was an interesting position for a, a you know, Ivy League academic to take. Now, going th uh, through the book, I, I, how did you start getting the ideas of what you were going to go into? Because uh, the book itself is just chock full of everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, we, I was going to sit down and go through straight through, but I decided just to flip through and start finding stuff I was interested in and then go back and get the rest. Right, right. And that's, you know, that's one of the things that's good about it is it does have somewhat short uh, sections. So, you know, if you find something you dig, you can read it and move on or you can kind of look and see how it plays out in the whole theory. Um, basically, the the concept, the theory as far as, you know, uh, uh, the the 
individual participants or the the people that are going to investigate and, and that they affect the manifestation process that's kind of an old old theory but uh, what really kind of just uh just got me to put pen to paper was uh just kind of synchronistic events that surrounded my daughter's birth and that just kind of got me inspired to actually get it out, get it down on paper and, and put it out there and with the 2012 focal point that kind of serves as a as a uh, concrete position, you know, uh, most of the time when you have prophecies are very ambiguous and they don't have dates and mm-hmm. uh, it's very much up in the interpretation. And there is plenty of that surrounding 2012 as well, but it's it's the first time in a long time we've had a firm date that can be confirmed, you know, at least to some degree academically. So I think that, uh, and I think you're going to see more and more people, you know, you're going to see history channels already out, what, 2012 programs are like on a couple times a week. So I think you're going to see that consciousness uh, of that of that date and, and the possibilities expand yeah see and, I, and i've always i'm starting to get more and more convinced that it's going to be more of a self-fulfilling prophecy than anything yeah. else you know it's, uh, and there's that dynamic at work too because i mean every generation has had uh somebody saying the end of the world is coming in our in our lifetime every generation has never failed and this has been true back to the time of christ so i mean that's nothing new but the the convergence of so many of these aspects, um, and it would, and through right there, you know, self self fulfilling prophecy absolutely would be uh, consistent because uh, kind of our theory is that the, that the consciousness will dictate what reality we have. So if uh, enough people are expecting doom and gloom, then that's a likely scenario. But I mean, we've had some very uh, strong strong evidence to support the idea that we could be going. I mean, if you just look at the Earth changes, which can be somewhat subjective, you know, it's kind of an open to interpretation, but I mean, the fact that, you know, the the earthquake in Chile literally shifted the pole off its axis, it changed, it made the day just infinitesimally shorter, you know, it's barely able to read, but it, that that indicates there was an actual pole shift, and that's one of the things uh, that people have been saying, well, it's fake science, there's not going to be a pole shift. Well, there's already happened a pole shift, and we're still almost three years out, so I mean, uh, you get with this and a lot of the earthquake activity and a lot of this other stuff that's, that's not so subjective as far as uh, it's happening over and over and it's at a higher degree than what's normally recorded. Um, it seems like the earth is going through some kind of uh, hullabaloo, so I guess we'll see kind of how that shakes out. Uh, I kind of got a dual theory on that. I think the earth is probably going to keep going the way it's going and kind of self-destruct uh, because because if you look at the nature, the pathology of like organisms, they tend to get rid of a disease, and mankind does tend to be a disease. But at the same time, we have the opportunity with uh, the information and the consciousness to kind of evolve to that next, uh, hopefully that non-corporeal, that uh, astral level where we're kind of uh, at this next level of, of being. And whether or not that happens, we'll see how it shakes out. Now, going into the book, um, I know there were some things that I told you we, I know we wanted to talk about. First right. and foremost, uh, <laughs> and, and kind of going into the uh, synchronicity or maybe even coincidence, yeah. uh, Phantom Clowns. Now, I was at there a party. Oh, yeah. and I have this real <laughs> thing about clowns. Wow. I read that today there's, and just went, ew. Yeah, there's a lot of chlorophobias. Uh, there's color phobias or something. So, yeah, there's, now, there's now, a nice little picture for you of the a, clown in there. So. What a Phantom <laughs> Clown is. Is that okay, like somebody um, who is dressed as a clown that died and is like haunting people as a clown because that um, is that is ridiculous. <laughs> what is uh yeah, right. That's that's just disturbing because that means tell me <laughs> that somewhere. is going to be my nightmare for the next like 8 years of my life. Right. That's uh, the attack of the killer clown. Oh, um, oh, oh guy. <laughs> no, no. All right, we got pop culture reference in there. All right. Hey, now, I um, like that movie. That was an awesome I movie. It, I love it. The cotton, the cotton candy cocoons was the best, man. <laughs> yeah. That? The imagery of Genius, but uh, I digress. Um, now the the phantom clowns are now people that are oh well, it's not assumed that they may be people that have died and uh, come back as clowns. Um, the phantom clown phenomena was first documented by um, uh, Warren Coleman. Uh, he kind of uh, followed the flap that started in 1981. Uh, it started on the East Coast and it uh, spread all the way to uh, Kansas City, Kansas, which is just a little bit west of where I am. So talking about whole half of the U.S. Basically, what was occurring, and it was occurring enough that they had police and and uh, and social workers go to talk to these kids at all these schools, you know, in Boston, Dover, um, a lot of places in Maryland, and all across the U.S., tell them to avoid these, you know, these these men that are, were dressed as clowns that had, that were trying to invite kids with either a candy or balloons into a van, which you know you would think that common sense would dictate, but you know, kids <laughs> do you not do? do that, <laughs> right? So. um and this is actually it ties in a lot to where actually the guy uh, the term "don't take candy from strangers" comes from. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. 
um, what was happening was these uh, these kids would uh, would see uh, clowns that would you know be trying to get them to to come into their van and, and uh, uh, assumingly abduct them. Now the interesting part was during this clown flap, there was they never caught any of these perpetrators. Now they they almost almost uniformly almost in every instance there was some kind of defect with the car. There was a broken tail light, or there was a headlight missing, or the 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 uh, ladder was ripped off the the van, or uh-huh. there was always some kind of deficiency. And uh, throughout this whole time, there was never one that was pulled over. There was, in Kansas City, Kansas, they chased a uh, machete wielding um, clown from uh, six different schools. Six different schools reported uh, two two clowns, one with a machete showing up. And, a machete uh, wielding ch- clown at schools. Machete wielding clown outside the school. Yeah, oh and the cops gosh. chased them all over Kansas City, Kansas, <laughs> and they never did catch them. And they they've never caught any of these people. Like I said, it's kind of interesting because of the fact that the, all these vehicles have, have have reports of you know having a tail light or this or that. You would think yeah. that you know, and I don't want to give anybody ideas, but uh, you know, if a, if a pedophile was out there, I, I would think that they would want to make sure that their vehicle was in tip top tip top shape because you don't want to get pulled over at a random. Traffic stop, you know, if you got oh, a yeah, you six know, year old, don't catch back, all so. your uh, machetes and chopped up kids. Uh, right, right. Um, so that was that occurred from like uh, it occurred for about eighteen months, but it was about a six month flat that was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty consistent, pretty uh, a lot of lot of uh, a lot of incidents were reported. Now, um, some of the detractors tried to say that well, it was that that was because the Stephen King movie came out and or the Stephen King book it came out. Yeah. And uh, Coleman points out that that was five years after the the first printing of it was five in 1986, five years after the Phantom Clowns. So, anyways, we flash forward to today. Uh, there was a minor outbreak in the late 80s, uh, and there's been a new outbreak in uh, in 2009 uh, in Chicago, and it started in Wicker Park, which Wicker is a name that has some occult connotations, and we kind of touch on that. We talk about devil names and some of these others like Lafayette and how names kind of uh, play a role in, in, in what paranormal manifests. But anyways, we, they, they got the first report from a Wicker Park, and then uh, the cops said that they had reports throughout the city. Um, we kind of uh, tie it together in with the Curse of the Joker in, in this way. Um, Chicago has an archetype template for clowns. They're, they're, they're a very strong clown thing, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, the first Ronald McDonald was from, uh, Illinois. The, uh, the serial killer, John Wayne Gacy, that was the clown serial killer, was, uh, from Chicago. You have Bozo, who was probably the most known clown in the U.S., but if not the U.S., then at least the Midwest. Um, you have several clown aspects that are already tied into Chicago. Now, what was interesting was these clown appearances started, um, just after the release of the um, new Batman, the Dark Knight film, where Heath Ledger had passed away during his role in that. And, uh, you know, so he's just, you have this iconic image that, you know, everybody was thinking about Ledger and that Joker performance, and it was really resonating in the conscious. People were kind of uh, tuning into that. And I think that with the history of the clown sightings in Chicago and uh, coupled with the the, the uh, clown consciousness uh, that was that was surrounding uh, jo- the Joker and Ledger's role, uh, that kind of uh, created the, the conditions that would manifest that. And uh, the last thing is that the uh, the uh, Dark Knight movie was filmed primarily in Chicago, so you could have something of a psychic resonance that was uh, applied there. So, wow. long story short, short story long. <laughs> no, I know. Uh, back when I was younger, uh, I remember for some reason, and I lived in rural. I mean, as rural as you can get. Right. Uh, and. Uh, uh, in southern West Virginia, and there was a point where I knew there was a uh, a family was talking about it, and I've been wanting to try to get a hold of my dad or my mom just to talk to them and see if they remember it, right. where there was supposedly these uh, people dressing as clowns driving around in a van trying to give people or right. kids poisoned candy or you know abduct them or whatever. Right. And this was, I mean, back in the early 80s. I remember. <laughs> you would think they would get caught. And, well, especially yeah. there, there of any place, you know. Right, right. You know, you think a clown would stick out there as opposed to the city. But um, exactly, <laughs> and I don't understand. But I, I remember hearing about that, and I, when I was looking through that, I was like, that reminds me of that. Yeah, really you young, ever, maybe in kindergarten. If you, if you do get a chance to talk to your mom or your pops, and 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 uh, they can shed any light on that, you know, shoot that to me. I'd love to hear about it. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll make sure I check and see. And it might have just awesome. been. Me putting two and two together and right, adding right. clowns into the story. Now right. you you talked about Dark Knight going off of that a little bit. 
right. uh, with the curse, kind of the curse of that movie with, uh, you know, Heath Ledger kind of getting into the character. A lot right. of people think that's what brought him to his death. But you also mentioned some other movies where, you know, kind of tragedy uh, came through. Yeah, uh, right, that attached itself to the, yeah. Um, and it ties in kind of with the main concept of our, of our book and that um, you can create your own reality. Basically, uh, with, with these movies, what you have is a big, large group of people that are coming together, working on a single single thought, a single idea, basically. It may be you know, two hours long, but it's a single, single thought stream. And when you put this dynamic together um, with with a lot of these darker, psychologically darker uh, movies, such as Exorcist, Poltergeist, um, I can't remember the bunch of the other ones, Dark Knight, there's like four or five of list. Um, you have the right chemistry to create basically a curse because it's working with dark psychological matter, um, stuff that would very much kind of uh, stick in somebody's head. Um, and then you're working as a group and you're putting that effort together. So... The uh, occult people in the Hebrew and a lot of different traditions recognize this, and one one word for it is egregore, which just basically means a group thought form uh, uh, that, that has like uh, that takes on a life of itself. Now um, we kind of see this, and then it's usually with the darker movies that we do see the curses, and I think that's because of the psychological themes. But um, you know, if you remember the first thing that uh, Nicholson told uh, the reporters when they he found out that uh, Ledger was dead uh, was, "I warned him." Now, he later went on to say, well, I'm, I was talking about Ambien, about the East Ambien, which is totally plausible, but it's a very cryptic comment to make, you know, right after, you know, you're, you're talking to the first Joker that tell him that the, that the other, the, you know, the new Joker just died, you know. So there's um, there's definitely some interesting aspects of that, and then, you know, you get into the synchronicity and kind of some of the some outlandish synchronicity, like uh, I think it was, um, oh, I want to say it was Omen, where you had uh, within a 24-hour period, uh one of the, I think it was Gregory Peck and I think the uh, director of the movie were on separate airplanes, and both those airplanes got struck by lightning within a 24-hour period. Oh wow! And then you got that. You, you put on top of that, there was a, there was a day they were supposed to sh- film the lions, these lions, in in, in the film, and uh, for some reason they they some, the the, the uh, lion people were overbooked or something. Some kind of something transpired where they couldn't do it that day, so they. They they decided to shoot the next day, but they found out the next day that uh, they couldn't do it basically because that day the lions had mauled and killed the security guard. Oh my uh, God! Yeah, so I mean, you know, you start working with some of these things and you just see some really weird stuff that really uh, defies statistical probability. And um, I think that you know it's kind of like that. You talk about self self fulfilling prophecy, and that's a lot of the way the curse works. You know, is if you acknowledge something like that, it's more likely to happen. So I think if you have groups of people working on something. It's much more likely to manifest in reality, and that's the whole idea behind prayer and that type of thing. I mean, because even if you look at like the word mass, mass is a group, a big group. So I mean, when you're going to mass, you're going to group, and that just kind of I think uh, amplifies the uh, the request or the 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 prayer or whatever whatever form you're going in. I think it just mag- amplifies it, magnifies it, whatever you have a group dynamic working. Now, have yeah. you ever heard of the Philip experiment? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You talking, uh, yeah, the the Canadian cat, right? The 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 group that created Philip the Ghost. Yeah, I, I was yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in there. That kind of reminded there. me. Of, for some reason, that reminded me of that, where you have right. a group of people that are trying to uh, create something, and it does manifest. You know, and that kind of yeah, and reminded what, me of that. And 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 I'm, and, and uh, the first thing we would point out is that that Philip never lived. He's not a ghost. He was never a living person. He was a totally fictional character. They they created a backstory for him. Um, they uh, I think the backstory went along the lines of he was uh, having an affair with a gypsy lady. Uh, the wife found out, killed the gypsy, so Philip committed suicide. They took pictures of the house where they were going to say he lived and all this stuff. Yeah, they had the had, whole backstory. I think we had a show on that, or that we talked about that a uh, number of months ago. You know where we just talked about you know what you can conjure up. You right. Know, no, absolutely. And 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 they were having you know they had massive success and there's been other ones that have that have done since um, there was the bachelor door experiments that yeah. were similar to that so basically what they do is they create a seance atmosphere and uh, they eventually were able to construct this thing that uh, could you know with the table that could uh, slide the table around that could levitate people that could bend a uh, key even uh, and a lot of the stuff went on whenever they weren't even there so I mean that's what's really interesting is either they were. At the, they were all focusing at the same time, or the other possibility is the entity developed some kind of consciousness of himself and actually operated outside of 
of the people that created them. And that's kind of when we get into tulpas and some of that shadow, uh, like uh, the shadow case out in uh, Greenwich Village, that where you create something that exists beyond, you know, the actual creators. That's yeah. that's when it really gets interesting because that, you know, that's on the level of magic. And, and then when you start to get into quantum physics and some of this other stuff that we've really been looking into in the past 10 years as paranormal investigators, you kind of see that the science is kind of catching up to a lot of the ideas that were once a cult or were once religious and, and that it's validating it more and more because we're moving into this universe where we understand that more and more of, of what we expect and, and, and our expectations, how they actually manifest that reality. Now, I, I wanna, think it's really I interesting. I want to ask you, uh, you know, while, while we still have time left, you know, because yeah. I, I find this a topic just as creepy as <laughs> your clowns. <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah. I think Nick had mentioned to you that we really wanted to talk about it already. These black-eyed kids. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're much the creepier than the clowns. <laughs> because let's a lot face of people it, fight let's face them, it, so. little kids are creepy. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, and there's nothing creepier than a uh, kid ghost. I'll take I'll take a roaring, roaring boogeyman over a kid ghost any day because oh, yeah, there is that. Know, just just like in the shadow of the two twins that are just standing you know? at the end of the hallway. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, Why are they there? Why do they need to be there? Why right. Yeah, yeah. no doubt. That's what, you know, that's why Stephen King stuck them in the Shining movie. Yeah. Um, no, the uh, the Black Eyed Kids um, uh, have been a phenomenon, and, and we've had reports of people with black eyes and demons with black eyes and vampires with black eyes for a century, so that's nothing new. Yeah, and we're not about. talking about, like, the black eyes right. that got beat up. Like, like <laughs> right, the, right. The uh, nor the black eyed peas, which always pops up when I try to do a PEK <laughs> search. So, oh. um, no, the the black eyed keys, uh, black eyed kids. Black eyed kids. Yeah, I know, right? I had to throw myself. The black eyed kids. Um, basically, the the this origin of their start was uh, around the the late 1990s, uh, around 98, I believe it was. There was a, a freelance journalist in Texas by the name of uh, Brian Bethel who gave his first encounter, and it was pretty pretty much consistent with what we see generally as, as being the core of the reports. Uh -huh. Basically what happens is uh, a couple kids, sometimes as many as five, but usually two, um, will approach your either car or your door. Uh, they'll knock and they'll startle you because they caught you, you know, uh, you know, not, not paying attention. Um, you kind of scold yourself for jumping about, you know, it's just a bunch of kids, but um, you roll down your window, you open the door a crack and you talk to them. They, they start out, you know, with, the, with a pretense like, uh, Oh, well, my friend was just in an accident. I need to use the phone to call the police, or I I need a ride to the store. Uh, my mom, you know, needs to get her medicine, and we don't have any 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 way to get there. Some pretense, yeah. and they'll try to try to get inside your house or inside your car. Uh, in Bethel's case, uh, he actually noticed that you know, even though he had no intention to let him in the car, he saw his hand was just drifting towards the lock, almost by by itself, like they were controlling him. Right, like uh -huh. an yeah, an element of mesmerism. In there. And uh, usually, there's, of the two kids, there's a smaller one and a larger one. They kind of have a Lenny and George of Mice and Men thing going on. The little one's uh, talkative, kind of slick. Um, he's, he seems much more kind of uh, sneaky. The big one seems like kind of like he's a big chowder head, basically, for lack of a better term. Yeah. But, um, and so, anyways, uh, you, you keep resisting and say, yeah, you can't come in. I'll, I'll make a call for you or whatever, whatever you excuse to give them. You don't let them in. And um, eventually, you know, they become more and more persistent, and they tell you, you know, you have to invite me in, or you have to let me in, you have to ask me to come in. And there's a lot of that in uh, a lot of these stories. Not in every story, but in a lot of these stories, there's uh, you have to invite me, you have to let me, you have to ask me. So basically what happens is you don't let them in. Um, what will happen next is that, you know, they'll, they'll walk down the hall or they'll walk down the street, and they'll turn a corner. Usually people will go and try to see, you know, where they went off to because they're – you know, these are strange beings with black eyes and kids, yeah. um, and they're, of course, gone. So that's, you know, uh, another element of the supernatural we see. In now, in that little story we told there, you do have the elements that, and, and recent, until recently, it's really been um, black eyed kids have kind of been put into this category of vampires and, and um, demons with the black eyes, um, with the, the asking the invitation because you have to invite the vampire in through some forms of folklore. Uh, you have to invite the devil in, that type thing, with the demons. Um, then you have the mesmerism, you know, the, the almost hypnotizing you. You have the disappearing around corners and this type of thing, which is all consistent with um, some of the demonology and some of the, the the folklore and vampires. But what we found out was um, there was other consistencies that were not part of the vampire lore. Like, uh, I think if most people heard my story and, they, and they're thinking about uh, black-eyed kids, they probably would see these, like, uh, pale... 
uh, because of the vampire connection and and the, the kind of children of the corn looking thing. Yeah, that's what I think of. I, I right, think that's, that's, the corn, I, yeah. I, that was my natural assumption too. I, you know, in my head, I could see, you know, the little... village of the damned. You know, they're all exactly, like, exactly. That's exactly what I think about. But this is not actually what's what the report. I think in sixty uh, percent of our reports, the kids were. Oh, kids, I say, but whatever. Were um, dark skinned. Um, they they were described as islanders. I've heard uh, Haitian, Samoan, Hawaiian, um, Filipino. Huh. So there's a there's a disconnect there. And um, yeah. the other thing that, that they really like to do, and and we'll kind of illuminate why this is relevant, is they wear they tend to wear um, either checkered pants, checkered shirts, or checkered hat. Now this isn't all the time. It's just it's something that comes on and off the radar, but it happens enough that it's considered to be it's a, you know, a, a pattern. Now, the, the, the aspect of those two things that are, that are uh, relevant is that those are both um, characteristics that are kind of uh, been, that are very closely related to the men in black uh, phenomena, which was um, a lot of Keel's observations when he was yeah. down in West Virginia. Yeah. He noticed that these people that were men in black, they were um, exotic looking. Yeah, one of the, see, one that, of the that terms happened right by us. That's not too far from us. You, you just yeah, said yeah, something that might that. get us never off the air. Jordan's a huge Mothman. I won't go into it. Okay. I won't go into it. We'll say yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll say that we'll for another we'll show. We'll have to contact, yeah, because I'm a big fan of Keel, and I love the whole there – there's a whole freaking thing there. Don't even get me started because that – they blew <laughs> that movie out of the water because there was so much strangeness going on. But anyways, <laughs> throughout the Mothman uh, prophecies, he, he talks about the men in black there, or, and some of the women in white, some of this other stuff, but they're, they're almost always exotic. They've been described as gypsies, dark – dark color people possibly negro and um this is something we've seen also you know then uh with the fan of the mothman prophecies there's the check the grinning grinning ghost the oh yeah that was shirt, my favorite one ghost. right See, and I've, heard, uh, I've heard that also with the black-eyed kids yeah the, absolutely the grinning yeah they have a demonic grim often actually we've got to go into one of the stories uh of one of the one of the stories we got from uh, a trucker and uh i, I won't get into it because it's kind of long but the point being is at the end she just had this demonic like smile that was like pulled up you know almost halfway up her face you know uh, where where it possibly couldn't be she seemed to have too many teeth and uh all kinds of madness so but there's those two elements that we we talked about the checkered shirt the checkered gear and um the darker colors the darker features is something that's interesting because those are not things that people would normally associate with uh with the black eyed kids you know if you just kind of made it up as you went along because they're they're counterproductive they're counterintuitive yeah. Um, you think vampires, children of the corn, you know, like we all did, you know, you get this, the village of the dance. And that's kind of, I think, I think that that kind of uh, lends a little bit of credibility to the, to the site. That doesn't mean it can't be made up or, or exaggerations or hallucinations, but it just lends a little bit of credibility because there is a pattern that it fits that's already been established in other places. Yeah. Now, I know, uh, I was just reading a book from um, uh, Jim Butcher's new uh, Dresden file book. And it reminded me, because I was reading through your Black Eyed Kids uh, uh, section, uh, he, uh, there's this thing where you have to invite people in, right. uh, and uh, it's based on the uh, magic of households, that, uh, right. if, that if you don't invite them in, like if somebody comes to my door, I'm afraid of whatever they could do to me in my house, right. you know, they say, well, can I come in? And uh, you know, I said, well, you know, I don't know, can you? And if they pass through the threshold, they lose their powers to some extent you know they uh, right. they leave it at the door because you know that's your home that you've made uh right. there may be some kind of, what's that no, i said it just contains the cumulative energy so exactly you know, now do you think that maybe there's some kind of aspect of that to this yeah there definitely could be um, that they can't be, harm them if they can't be invited in yeah it, there definitely could be an aspect because it is consistent enough that we are seeing it listed uh, over and over and over again so I think there's definitely something there when there's smoke, there's fire. So it absolutely could be because I mean, it's see, just like I think said, there's a know? part that we're not paying attention to here. You know, uh, beyond the whole inviting in and all that kind of stuff, if you have a kid coming up with jet black <laughs> eyeballs <laughs> and wants to do with you, why would you let him in? You yeah, it is a little come in. No, yeah, I'll get my shotgun. You know, <laughs> you would never shoot a kid. I would. <laughs> <laughs> a kid comes at me, I'll shoot him. You heard it here first. <laughs> Just in time for the trial. Now, <laughs> now, Sean, what is? Because I, I, there's all kinds of stuff in here. I, I, and I, and I found the Philip thing, so now I've got that marked to where I can go read it later. What is your, what is your favorite thing in this book? Uh, what is your favorite thing to research? I mean, other than kill, you just mentioned. Right. 
Um, there's a lot of aspects. I think one of the more interesting parts was kind of the psychology of, uh, of the paranormal um, in that, you know, a lot, in a lot of ways we kind of uh, divorced the human element out of, out of these interactions. Um, we try to look at it as objective observers, but of course, anything we observe has to pass through a perceptual filter. It has to pass, you know, we can't observe something outside the mind. Uh, and that's the same with all information. So uh, I always find, I find it interesting that a lot of these um, phenomena seem to be much more interactive than uh, than what we first thought. And I think we started to see that a little bit in Mothman, and that's been continued in, like, Contact Ranch, Skinwalker Ranch, uh, the Mystery. Yeah, like the Jersey Devil, too. Exactly. It, it evolves, and it kind of – and that was one observation I had made about the uh, Hellhound was – that it seems like that it, that these that this specific entity that has the hellhound around here pops up about once every generation. It's almost as if to reinforce that it exists, then it will go back into obscurity for another twenty years, and then like pop up place. again. Now, uh, with the psychology of paranormal, uh, some of that is I know some people like uh, Lola has is dying to see something. Now, we, yeah. you know, we're going to the prison in June. Right. Uh, 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 near the near here, uh, West Virginia State Penitentiary. Uh, okay. Is there any aspect of what, somebody that could prepare themselves so that they might be able to yeah, experience something? To be more open. Yeah, you can definitely uh, work some um, some astral dreaming techniques and stuff because you're working a lot of this uh, of this this uh, ghost manifesting this type type things. Some of it is uh, objective and it's attached to a certain place, but a lot of it is kind of transient. And I think if you uh, a lot if you can tap into the subconscious, I think you can see a lot more than what what we can here in the West. Like in the East, they they're seeing spirits all the time. And I know I don't mean like metaphorically, but they they literally see spirits. And I've seen some amazing things just through my mom's uh, through you know my wife's mom's uh, practices and stuff that I that defy any rational explanation. So I think if you kind of put yourself in that state of mind, you're much more susceptible. It's it's, it's just the idea of like attracts like, and once you're once you've seen something, it's much easier to see it again because it's already been established in, in what you believe. Until you see something, it's just a story. It's just a book. You know, It's just something else that somebody else experienced. What you experienced. Becomes... So you think Lola should just like totally immerse herself into all things paranormal until she goes? Just with... I, you know, I, I, I'm sitting in my room right now. I have 350 books about, about paranormal. I've got Bigfoot tracks. I've got <laughs> pictures of ghosts and everything. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a believer in that. Yeah, if you surround yourself by that type thing. Um, you're much more likely to be able to, to witness it. But at the same time, you know, I have such a problem. Like when I go out by myself or with another crew member, uh -huh. uh, I hit about 2 to 5%, usually lower, but 2 to 5% uh, for anomalies on film. Now, if I take my wife out, it bumps up to uh, over 30%, wow. which is just insane. <laughs> Yeah. So Where do you got you live? Welcome. Okay, I might make a road trip. I want to take a a trip with your wife. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, I think part of it is you know is the fact that she comes from the the line of you know people that work with spirits yeah. anyways. Yeah. And I think part of it is that I believe in it. You know, you know that might play a dynamic too. But yeah, every time we go out with her, man. I mean, there's only been one trip where we didn't get anything, and I just don't think there's anything to get there. But every time we get. The, I think the wildest one I've seen that, that recently that she got was a uh, – she got an orb, which is, you know, not anything particularly yeah. interesting. Um, but the orb was actually – it had the same colorings of uh, the Pepsi the Pepsi uh, sign, oh, the, wow. the blue and the red swatch. And if you look at uh, the South Korean flag, that That's is the middle is, of the yeah. – yep, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So I, I think that she – so the orb was probably there, but she projected an image on it. Is what I'm thinking. Something like Ted Sirius or something like that. So. What, Jordan? I, I said, do you think that your wife projected the image on it? I think that there was an orb there. I think there was something there in objective reality, but I think sh she projected that Pattern. image on yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like if you go back into the, like the whole alien abduction versus fairy abduction thing. Um, the the whole thing is very very similar. You have fairy rings, you have crop circles, you have feminine aliens, you have feminine uh, uh, fairies, you have uh, a bright light from an unknown source, uh, the levitation, the paralysis, um, yeah. sometimes the ingest ingestation of ingestion, so having to drink a bitter substance uh, before going on the trip. So there's a lot of the the the, the the alien hybrid thing is also, you know, fairy, because the fairies, uh, back in the day, was fairy stole my kid and replaced him with a fairy. Is that so. a doppelganger? Or so, yeah, exactly. I mean, you have a lot of things that I think that are probably objective events that happen really, but it's just a matter of how we interpret it. 
um, like now, since we live in the age of aliens and the future and whatever, we, that's how we interpret it. But back then, you know, we lived in the age of fairies and magic, so that's how we interpret it. So I think it's just a matter of how we're interpreting it. And I think it's becoming more and more evident that there's something interactive, that's something that's working to try to establish itself, you know, in whatever form. Uh, Gia Tree, by the way, says hello, Sean. Who's that? Gia Tree. I guess uh, you've off. been on our show before. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Tell her hello. That's great. Now I, I I heard you mention Bigfoot's earlier Bigfoot earlier and Jordan huh? hates Bigfoot. George, Jordan <laughs> has a this, Bigfoot. You do you if hate I was Bigfoot? Believe in something, so, it wouldn't be Bigfoot. Yeah, you get I, I, angry I, I, every time we mention Bigfoot. And, yeah, see, and and two percent of the proceeds in my book go to the uh, Jerky for Sasquatch Fund. I mean, <laughs> I'm <pissing> them off. <laughs> I'll have to run out and buy 10 copies right now. <laughs> right. Yeah, if I if I got to the beach, that's what they say. I'm going to have for some jerky because I don't, don't like it on his fast side. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, so, uh, what's your beef with Bigfoot? I, I, I just... I. <laughs> I we don't, don't believe in it, I actually. In it. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, put I, it bluntly. I, I, we get a lot of shows that stretch what I may or may not right. believe, and I, I'm comfortable saying that you know, <laughs> without... Revealing, right? Things, you know, well, no, actually, and, uh, Jordan and I had from who was that? I don't remember. His name. I don't. I don't either. Uh, he, he was. He was going to fly us out there, to and Arizona. yeah, and let us go on this expedition with them and like sleep out in the desert and all this uh -huh. stuff. The kicker was though, we had to pay for our own way home. <laughs> so, <laughs> needless to say, uh, no road trip. But no road yeah, trip. yeah, yeah, that's it a was, little bit of an expensive. You, uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah that you guy know, you get the that. offer like that, and he says, "Yeah, come out here, and I'm staying in Arizona until I find something." Yeah, it's like, <laughs> right. So I he wasn't there for a long time. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the the, the, the big well. I mean, is a point of contention for so many people because it's uh, it's it's a whole thing because you've got your flesh and blood cryptozoologists who believe that there could be some kind of North American ape or yeah. think there could be. Uh, possibly, you know, there's evidence, and there's some dermal, uh, dermal, dermal evidence that's you know suggestive and these type of things. But at the same time, you have so many Bigfoot reports that have so much, so many elements of the supernatural. Yeah. Um, a lot of times you'll have them, you know, in the 70s we had uh, Bigfoots wearing checkered shirts, <laughs> like Paul Bunyan lookalikes or something. Um, you have Bigfoots in the proximity of UFOs, some of them coming out of UFOs. Yeah. Hey, you know, you start taking this stuff to a uh, flesh and blood cryptozoologist, and they're going to laugh you out of the room, my friend. So I think that, yeah, it's, it's really hard to um, kind of look at it. And Nessie's another one that, you know, um, I think is probably more of an astral-type projection than an actual, you know, flesh and blood entity. But really? in a lot of the places that these lakes uh, sit, there's not enough, you know, there's not enough food source for, to, su to supply a, a family of plesiosaurs or large um, eels or whatever it is. Yeah, we, we, we've heard the, yeah. the, the gigantic eel theory. Yeah, I, and I mean, it's the gigantic eel theory is more plausible to me than the plesiosaur. The plesiosaur but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but still, I, I, I don't know. I just, I, I, like I said, there's places where, the like in the Skinwalker Ranch case, there's the, um, the, the lake that they had down there that was man-made. Yeah. You know, within, within the, the people remember it being made, but they still have reports of this snake sea monster thing that you know has dragged people to their death and such. So I think, yeah, you um, know, from again, back I think in that's the dinosaur of, times when it wasn't there. right. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, I mean, but they it's, dug too it's hard deep. To, it's hard yeah. to introduce a plesiosaur to a controlled environment like that. So, I think that we're dealing with something um, not not all the time in cryptozoology, but but with your werewolves, your possibly your Bigfoots that are that are probably something that's interdimensional or or that is an archetype that's part of our our hardwired into our brain and our belief systems, and that that's how we interpret it. But you know, that's all psychic or psycho psychoanalytical mumbo jumbo. So. <laughs> That's uh, speculation on my part. It was Tom Biscardi, by the way, that was going to yeah, bring was, you guys yeah, out there. Yeah, it was him. Well, okay, we okay. haven't heard from him lately. Yeah. I didn't see any <laughs> tickets coming FedEx. Yeah. <laughs> he might not be. He might have you found something. Out, yeah. That's true. Maybe Don't Bigfoot decided to have him for dinner. And, and it's Gia Scott. I, I have no idea what I'm yeah, talking yeah. about. What am I doing? I, I was like, gee, I know gee, I know gee. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, 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 My apologies for getting for, for yeah, not getting it off the, the top. Time, Sean, we don't let Nick read. So. Yeah. I, I <laughs> read well, I just don't read right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm half Mexican. I can barely read it all. So. <laughs> oh. It's all good. It's all love. Oh, <laughs> that was him. That was not us. <laughs> yeah, we'll get hate mail.
Yeah, I will get hate mail. You got it. Yeah. You know, send it to me. It was Jordan that yeah. said it. Jordan gets all the hate mail. They just tell me how much they love me all the time. <laughs> and they ignore me. Yeah. Well, you're looking at the right place then. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, the time's just about up, you guys. Oh, no. I know. This has been a great night. We've had two really great, well, three, actually, guests yeah, three. on tonight, and oh, it's yeah. been so much fun. Uh, Sean, we, we do have your book on our website, whispersradio.com. Uh, cool. Got a picture of it. You can click on it, and it'll go to Amazon, I believe. And we have cool. your website for going to Spooks Up, too. So. Cool, cool. Yeah, it's, uh, you can hit it at paranormalcookbook.com or spooksfield.com. Uh, it's all your fine stores and all that good stuff. I'll get that out there so my, my publicist doesn't, you know, kick me in my pants next time I see him. All right. Well, tell your wife that the first time I'm out that way, I'm definitely giving you guys a call. Yeah, you guys, I mean, I, hey, I may actually have to give you guys a holler. I'm planning on going down for the, uh, the Mothman Festival, so oh, closer to your neck of the woods. Wow. Well, you should come over to the prison with us in, in June. We've got tickets I may have left. to do that. I may have to send me some info. Is it on your website, you said? Yeah, if you go to our website and click on Ghost Hunt. It's June 30th. It's a Wednesday, which is kind of a uh, weird day, but Wednesday into Thursday, six hours. It's cheap. There's a demonologist going to be talking. Yeah, all it's, kinds a, of crazy it's stuff. Not, not really interesting. Hey, yeah. hey Sean, I want to interrupt you guys real quick. Got a guy here at the market house who wants to, wants to know what spooks, what, what that stood for again. Uh, Springfield Paranormal Organization operating with kinetic surveillance. It's a mouthful. <laughs> yes, it is. That's why it goes by Spooks. That's why it goes by <laughs> I have to ask you, did you look and say, I want the name to be Spooks. we got to find something to match this. Yeah, yeah which came first? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, okay, I like this name. I'm going to figure out a match and then it's going to fit. So I just kind of played with words. And so that's going to sound halfway now. It was yeah. a non so. Oh, we're starting to lose, yeah, you're, yeah. you're starting to break up now. But I think I know what you said. You like the name. You figured it out a way to do it, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. All right. Sometimes okay. you just got to do what you got to do. That's yeah. right. That's right. Hey, uh, Sean, well, we want to thank you again. Uh, we had and, a great uh, time. You will be hearing from us again. Okay. Yeah, anytime you want to talk about anything paranormal, anything like that. We, Like I said, I've got a huge library, and all I do is read and do field work. So anything you want to talk about, we can go at it. That's awesome. Oh, we'll have oh, you back great. for sure. Hey, thanks a lot, Sean. Thanks. thanks, guys. You guys have a good night. Have a you good too. Time. What do you think? What? What do you think? I think he's great. I, 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 tonight was good. Yeah, I had a. I really enjoyed both both hours. Now, see, I'm still. I'm not 100 percent sold on the the Ouija board book writing. You know, I'm not. Well, but now that I know what they meant by that, because the first thing, yeah, the first thing I thought it was like you did. Wow, how tedious spelling out every word, but. If you're reading it and you're you're doing it into a tape recorder, and you guys were right, they should get voice recognition. Yeah. Oh, that's speed up. They get four or five books out. Yeah. <laughs> that makes more sense. And and why not? I mean, if you can open that kind of a channel with the spirit side. Yeah. Um, you know that that's the most efficient way for them to get any warnings or what you know whatever that they're they're thinking about out there. I just like I said before, I I I would like to try it, but I want to try it with them. <laughs> You'd want to try it in a way that somebody other than you gets possessed. That's right. You know, I'm you know one has to look out for one's best interest. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Lo, I guess we are out of time. I want to I want to let everybody or remind everybody get your pen tickets now because yeah. if you wait too long, so many people waited till it was too late last year. I think, yeah, we had people emailing us at the end, like, "Are there any tickets left?" We had we had a back uh, rain call list that was like 30 people long, and, and you know, if you get on there quick, we won't sell your spots. And uh, we, and we like I, like I said before, you know, we, you've already told me you have you have a list already started. Of, yeah, I've already got a list of 15. Yeah, and those people are like, "I'm definitely going," and they're ready to give you money, you know, before we even picked a price. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 So get get on there, whispersradio.com. It'll say at the top, Ghost Hunt. Click on it, and it'll have a PayPal button. Click on it. That goes right to me. So I'm going to try to remember, I'm gonna because uh, I know a lot of people came from out of state, uh -huh. uh, to get some uh, hotels uh, near the area uh, and maybe call and see if we can set up something for people. And, and even if you're so. uh, questioning out there whether or not, <clears throat> excuse me, whether or not you want to, uh, you know, go, but you're afraid about hotel rooms, we can we can help you. We can hook you up. Uh, yeah. With the local hotels, uh, Grandview Park has been a big help. I know they have cabins, they have 
all kinds of stuff. They have really neat, really nice looking cabins. They're not very expensive. You know, you can plan a whole weekend trip. Yep, yep, yep. Well, let's get out of here, Jordan. Uh, get you uh, home and us home. Uh, so that sounds like it's it. Do we got anybody for next week yet, Nikki? Uh, I've got people, but I just want to make sure they're confirmed. Okay. So they're waiting for phone call it's back. It's a surprise. It's a surprise. All right, next week, back in the studio. Great time for all. Until then, don't be afraid, only believe. <laughs>